Okay, it's 45. Let's just start. It's, um, I think I'll switch to the opening keynote next year, right? So, so <laughs> but it's really cool of you that you're still hanging out here, right? It's like, uh, well done. These are the real, it's either that you've solved bugs the whole day and you just love asking, looking for a laugh, right? So you come to the right place, basically. So um, it's, it's, I'm going to do a talk about um, changing your ways of working to actually um, be able to uh, to cut the cut current day challenges to to the right end, right? Because the challenges these days, I'm an old guy, right? But the challenges these days in 2023, it's not even about AI picking in our jobs, but it's the challenges are actually quite big that we have. So um, and they're much bigger actually than we ever needed to face before. So. It starts off with a, a little chat about quality, right? So quality is a very interesting thing. So if you go to the supermarket, and this is at my supermarket in Amsterdam, um, and you can buy coffee, right? And coffee comes in different grades. So usually the better the coffee is, the higher the, 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 the brand is, the, 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 more, the better they pick the coffee beans, basically, the more expensive it gets. So there's a sort of... There seems to be a relationship between quality and price. Now, if you go out and buy a car, let's say you go to the second-hand Audi dealer, um, uh, my local dealer, and, um, and you say, well, I want a car. The better the car, the faster the engine, the bigger the engine, the more features it has, the more expensive it is. Right? This is the model that we are all used to when it comes to quality. Now, there's this interesting thing about software where talking about quality is a little bit different. Um, and it, you, you should look at it like this, right? This is the model that we're all used to. When we try to buy something, we make these decisions about, you know what, I don't have the money to buy the highest brand, or I don't want to spend that money on a car or on coffee or, or whatever else. So I'm going to try to shift where my sweet spot is between price and quality. That is what we do every day, right? This is a, the, these are the everyday decisions about quality. The problem with software is, what does that actually mean, quality in software? Now, quality in software can be lots of things, right? They all end with uh, TY. That's mandatory, right? So, like, mandatory should also be on here. But there's lots of stuff that actually, except for fault tolerance and coexistence, but, but lots of things come into play when you talk about quality of software. And it, it is actually a very different thing. So deciding on what's the best quality for the money that we have available when it comes to software is a very different debate. And actually, you can, might say that software is sort of like, the quality is intangible. By the way, I talked about Jeroen GPT this morning. This is Jeroen. Well, this is Jeroen's back, basically. Um, he knows everything, basically, right? And, and uh, by the way, the guy who sits next to him is Eugene. And Eugene is Romanian. Um, nothing particularly you can see about him, but he's Romanian. Um, and um, <laughs> just an interesting note. So when it comes to software, finding the balance between quality and how much you are willing to pay for it as a company that has the software built is a very different, or a very difficult matter. You see, when it comes to software quality, if you want something really quick and simple and you're not interested in keeping it alive for the next 30 years, then you might good, but you might do cheap, right? You can just build, let's say I want to build a mobile app to actually see the, um, uh, the, the times that planes leave in the airport here in Cluj, right? I could figure out an API, build some stupid, silly mobile app for it in probably a day. And if I use ChatGPT, I'm twice as fast, right? So I can do it in half a day. And uh, not true, by the way, if you didn't follow the discussion this afternoon. However, if your software needs to run for a very long period, let's say 30 years, then it becomes a very different thing. And the nice thing is about the quality of software, that in the long run, quality actually matters and becomes cheaper than just building stupid stuff directly. Right? I'll give you a simple example. Is um, uh, I'm working on this open source framework with um, a couple of guys, including Rob. And what we figured out, also on our own libraries, is that we have unit tests for basically everything. I think we have like a 95% code coverage, but you could probably look it up on GitHub. 
that makes changing that library a lot easier than if I wouldn't have any test at all. I could probably have written the code faster, although you could debate that too. However, if I need to maintain it for a long time, and that's with open source the case, right? You do want to have all those tests. And it looks like it's more expensive. However, it's actually not. Are you working on, so does anybody have software, work, is working on software that has been alive for more than 10 years? Currently, right? It happens, like, um, the oldest software that I ever worked on um, was already 30 years old. It was still in production, and it ran. It was pretty cool, by the way, because it was built in COBOL. So we, have, we had a team of COBOL developers in the company, and then every night it was sort of transpiled into Java, <laughs> and then the Java was put in production in a lot of customers. It was a really interesting concept. So here's the thing. If you start running into this thing called technical debt, you are actually doing not enough effort, and the balance shifts towards lagging behind, so not picking up the quality that you probably should have when your software needs to run for a long time. Now, the question is, of course, what is technical debt? Now, this is Ward Cummingham. He, uh, he invented technical debt, so before he invented it, there was no technical debt, right? Just like Newton with gravity. And, um, and he said, well, shipping first-time code is like going into debt. A little debt speeds development so long as it is paid back promptly with refactoring. I like, oh, refactoring, yeah, but that takes a lot. I don't have the time to refactor. It is not an item on my JIRA board. It doesn't have to be. It's part of the work, right? It's part of your cycle. And, and then he says, well, if you look carefully, then you can say that entire engineering organizations can be brought to a standstill under the debt load of an unfactored implementation, object-oriented or otherwise. You might think, oh, maybe it's functional programming is better. No, it's not. Maybe structural procedural coding is better. No, nope, it's not. It's all the same. It doesn't matter. The more you get into technical depth, the more expensive it becomes to maintain quality. And there you need to find this balance. And if you don't, well, you get into these really nice situations that I'm going to give you some examples. About 10 years ago, I was the CTO for an insurance company. And at that insurance company, we had um, a lot of legacy code. It was the code that was running in production. It was 30 million lines of code. Three zero million lines of code. Of which there were 18 million, one eight, in COBOL and 12 million in Java. They had done six attempts on replacing the whole thing. They couldn't. Every attempt took two years, so they had already spent 12 years on this thing when I got there. And, um, and the problem they have is it ran on a mainframe, and the mainframe was in the basement of that particular company. The problem with the mainframe was that they could not update the operating system anymore. That was, for some reason, technically not possible which means, well, it was leaky, basically. So at some point in time, it will have fallen over. It got worse because the, language, the code was written in this particular language. This is COBOL, or actually it's a variation of COBOL. So COBOL comes in a lot of dialects too. It's even worse because it's in Dutch. Now, not, not a lot of people here in Romania can read Dutch, except for Eugene, but um, <laughs> that's why he lives in Amsterdam, I suppose. But <laughs> so it's not only in Dutch, it's also full of abbreviations that nobody knows what this means. So that means that only the original developers could still maintain this code base. But they were actually aging. This is not, this is not them, by the way. They look a bit like this, but um, so <laughs> they, um, they got older and they wanted to retire. They couldn't. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I should actually uh, I took, take a, I, I'm going to take a picture of my mom and her boyfriend. My mom is 84. She's in an elderly home. And she, she just got a new boyfriend. She told me last week, actually. I'm going to marry him, she said. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Hi, Dad. I said to him. So, no. <laughs> He's not my dad. So, anyway. So, second example. This is an e-commerce company. This is my current client. And it's a very nice company, and they have like daily new deals, which makes them fairly unique. They have like a unique tone of voice. And the problem is that over time, they grew a lot, and they grew really fast, actually. So they started with three, four persons, and they managed everything from an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and then it grew, and they built all these systems, and every time they needed to add something, they just added it. 
Like, um, you know what, we have a bunch of PHP developers now, our CMS is written in PHP, and now we need to do something with the user accounts. You know what, we'll just put them in CMS because we now have PHP developers. And later on, they got Python developers developing their ERP system, and they put claims in there, right? They don't belong in the ERP system, but well, they had developers for that, so they just put it there. As a result, well, basically they had all these systems and they did some events into microservices and they had a lot of cloud platforms and lots of other systems that they needed to interact with. And uh, what happened is over time, because they put everything everywhere, the data was everywhere. Also in systems we don't even own. So um, our marketing systems, which we don't own, they just run in the cloud or on somebody's laptop actually, and, and there is part of our data there. I don't really like that actually particularly, but it happens, right? And then they said, well, we need to sort of make sure that all this data is in sync everywhere. So they built all sorts of technologies, including sending emails with Excel spreadsheets, CVS files. Uh, they have built an ESB on Mule um, and, um, and, and RabbitMQ, and there's all sorts of ways this data sort of is spread around. And then they got into trouble because what happened is they spent so much time, and this is a pattern you see a lot, right? They spent so much time on making sure they could keep it running that the whole development team was tied up in making sure that everything kept running. As a result, they had no innovation time left, right? Their mobile app hadn't been released in two and a half years. Now, this is an e-commerce company, right? They need to do new stuff all the time, every day. They just couldn't. They got totally stuck. Now, this is called technical death, I would take it, right? So, technical death is a really interesting situation if you're a company, then you're mostly like, well, some bad words, right? Now, the question is, what is the real problem behind this? Is it actually lazy developers that don't write tests? No, not always, because if you're an insurance company, the coding COBOL was written, but well, they started writing that 30 years ago. There were no unit tests at that point in time. They tested everything manually. And then the system changed and changed and stage, and nobody kept the tests up to date, the tests that they had in the spreadsheet that they run for all the time. Every time they released every three months, then they would rerun everything. Somebody would push all the buttons and dot all the dots, and, and then we'd go on again. They couldn't do that anymore. So the problem is not so much the developers, good for us, by the way, it's always the organization. Because here's the thing, if you are a fast-growing organization or you're not a fast-growing organization, the same pattern happens every time again and again and again. And if I summarize it, it's the thing called the innovator's dilemma. Now, the innovator's dilemma is actually a really nice graph. It basically says this. So you're a company or an organization, you build a product or a service or whatever you build, and you know what? You start adding features to it, and over time, people adopt it. So the adoption rate goes up, and then you add more and more and more stuff to it, up to the point that no matter how many new features you add to your platform or your service or your product, it doesn't grow anymore in user base, right? It stays the same. It doesn't grow anymore. I used to work for a company that built the very first smart thermostat, maybe even in the world. And they, didn't, they, they, they went successful, and then they were like, what shall we do with it? Oh, let's show the weather forecast on the device that's on the wall in somebody's house. That sort of made sense. And then they were like, what shall we do next? And they started adding traffic information to the device on the wall in your house. Pretty useless, right? But yeah, they could do it, right? And then they started investigating energy patterns and making sure that you understood where you could save money. It sounded useful, but it cost more money than it ever made. In the end, the company went bankrupt. They disappeared, although they had a very interesting product. So what happened is, over time, other companies got into the same zone, but much later, meaning they could use newer technology to do the same, or got better business cases for what they were doing. In our case, this company where we're overhauled by the Tados of this world, the Google Nest, everybody started building smart thermostats, and they were doomed because they were too small to keep up. Now, this is the point where you need to reinvent yourself. This is called the dilemma zone. If you're in the dilemma zone, you need to recognize, and that's not easy to do, actually. If you recognize that you're in the, in the, in the dilemma zone, you are actually up for something that uh, Alex called yesterday a tall order. I'd never heard of the phrase before, but he said, yeah, yeah. it's actually uh, a tall order is a task or job that is difficult to carry out, like lifting 500 pounds if you're a weightlifter. 
or like rebuilding 30 million lines of code in legacy systems, right? This is tough. And the question is, how do you deal with this stuff? Uh, this is my favorite scene from um, Finding Nemo, right? They finally escape from the fish tank, and they're in the sea in plastic bags. And then they say, okay, now what? The, the, by the way, the movie doesn't tell that, actually. It's like, this is the end of the movie. So this is a good point to introduce myself, if you don't already know. This is me. Uh, this is on stage in... Um, oh, DevOps in Greece, I think. So um, I made that. I have kids. Uh, so does my girlfriend. Not the same kids, by the way. Um, and uh, I still take care of them, although they're like 27, 24, and 18. The 27-year-old still lives in my house. Really nice. Um, <laughs> I speak a bit. I write a bit. I travel a bit. And I'm basically a lifelong programmer. I started programming in 1977. You were like, what? I wasn't even born then. And I still write code every day, right? I checked in my code this morning before I went to see some talks, and I hope they got through the pipeline. So, um, currently, I'm the CTO for iBoot, which is the e-commerce company I was talking about. And oddly enough, um, so we started rejuvenating it. We got them through the dilemma zone. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about how we did that. Um, and we, we actually won the overall website of the year award in the Netherlands in um, November or something it was. Last year, I was there at the election, and, I'm, and uh, so, so we all got a prize. Every category got a prize, right? And you pay for that. That's how it works with ceremonies and, and, and dinners and stuff. And then we won the overall award. And I said to the CEO, I said, so how much did we pay for it? He said, we didn't. I'm like, what? We actually won? And um, uh, he was as surprised as I was, actually. So it was quite nice. So um, just a short illustration. I am a programmer. It shows in my last name. So I'm basically double object oriented. It gets worse, so I live in the Java street. <laughs> it's true, actually. This is for my balcony. So uh, <laughs> also work on an open source uh, framework, which is in TypeScript, but there's lots of nice concept in there. And the thing that I would like to note is that uh, everything I tell, it works for us. That doesn't mean it necessarily works for you guys, right? It might be different in your situation. If so, take out of this talk what you want. So the question is, how do we get past the innovator's dilemma? How do you get through that specific dilemma zone? And the answer is, you need to do continuous renovation. What does that mean? And you're like, oh, we're never going to get rid of our 30-year-old code base that I don't want to work in anymore. Well, partly. So the problem usually is that while you might spend time on innovation and renewing everything, you also need to make sure that the shop stays open. right? It's, if you're an insurance company, you cannot say, you know what, this year we're not going to do anything because we need to rebuild the system. If you're an e-commerce company, you cannot just say, we'll close for the rest of the year because, well, we need to build this whole new platform. That means that in most cases, you will have to work with the legacy code base, the stuff that works, and at the same time try to get beyond the innovator's dilemma. But if you're totally stuck in technical debt, that is really hard. So here's what we did in a number of these situations. We took small steps. It's the only way out. You cannot do big projects if you're in this situation. You have to take it step by step by step by step by step, which basically adheres to John Gold's law. He says, well, a complex system designed from scratch never works, right? Remember this. A complex system designed from scratch never works, meaning um, you need, you have to start over with a working simple system. That's always the case. You always need to be aware of the fact that you, well, on the one hand, need to maintain all the stuff, cause time, and you start over small and take it step by step. And um, uh, also, this interesting uh, frame, do you know this model, the Kneffel model? Cool. It's, it's, it's really vital, actually, if you, if you go into this space. I'll explain it really briefly. So if you are in the clear zone, that means the problems in the clear zone have a best practice. So um, if the dishes, I complain about the dishes again, if the dishes are on the sink in my kitchen, uh, my, my kids don't know where the dishwasher is actually. I don't know why, they just haven't, they lived in this house for 10 years, they don't know where the dishwasher is, they put everything on the sink. Now, I can complain about it all I want, but the easiest way is for me just to put it on the sink, switch on the dishwasher, done, right? It's the easiest way around, and that is the best practice I've figured out. If you are in a complicated zone, there might be a bunch of good options. 
And you have to choose from these options. Like if you do um, identity access management, right? There's like six or seven different options, and you would choose that one, and you just implement it. Make a choice, do the analysis, do the work. It's, it's manageable, right? You can still do this even in a waterfall project if you want to, right? But then you get to the hard parts. This is where you go <coughs> into the complex and the chaotic zones. And, and the, the nasty thing is, if you're doing new stuff, if you're innovating, you're always on the left side of this diagram. Um, being in the complex and complicated zones, or in the uh, chaotic zones, means there are no good practices. There is no best practice. That means practices at best might be emerging, sometimes from what you do yourself, sometimes from what others are doing right now, right? Like in, in, in AI, do we have a final solution to um, include AI in what we do and generate content for it? No, we just try it out and see what happens. And if it doesn't happen, we'll try something else, right? That is the space that you get in if you do innovation. Now, there's, two, there's a big difference between the complex and the chaotic zone. In the complex zone, you have a direction. There's somebody in the organization that says, we want to be there in three years' time. Which means that if you are innovating, if you are renovating, you can actually work towards that dot on the horizon. If you're in the chaotic zone, there is no such thing. That means you have no idea where to go, you just go. That is basically the strategy out of here. So the question is mostly is, have we done this before? If we've done this before, um, uh, in our team, in our company, you're probably on the, on the right side of the diagram. If not, like in the last two sentences here, somebody's done this, but not in this context, or nobody's done this before, you, you're basically doomed. There's only one way out, and the one way out is actually best described by Dave Snowden, who is the author of this particular framework. And Snowden says, well, basically, that's a long piece of text that I'm not going to read. He says, the chaotic domain is nearly always the best place for leaders to impel innovation. So this is what you do. This is where the innovation starts. So there's one way out of this, and that's doing experiments. There is no other way out of this. So you need to figure out what to do step by step by step by step. And you need to take the steps as small as possible. Then you get to the model that I would like to introduce to you. Right? Basically, it consists of four, well, let's say four major um, um, parts. Well, first of all, it's stop doing projects. Projects don't work in our industry. The reason they don't work is because most of the work we do is on the left side in the Kinefin framework. That means we don't know exactly where we are going. As a result, we cannot estimate it correctly. You hear it correct, you cannot estimate it correctly, right? You cannot even get close to estimating it. If you have that feeling, you are on the left side in the diagram. And because you cannot estimate it, you cannot plan. And if you cannot plan, you cannot do traditional waterfall style development. Meaning, there is a reason you cannot estimate your work. It's because you are on the left side of the diagram. If you are able to estimate the work, like the COBOL teams I work with, they were perfectly capable of estimating Every change that they made, up to two decimals after a comma. By the way, if you give up estimates, always use two decimals after the comma, right? So you're not going to say it is about 20 weeks. You're going to say it's 20.71 weeks. That means the managers will actually think that you made a calculation, right? It gives them a sense of security. They like that, actually. So the second step is you need to go into shorter cycles. And if you're, you're like, oh, wait, we're already doing Scrum. No, I mean short. I don't mean Scrum, I mean shorter, basically. So I'll illustrate that too. And then, you're going to do this with even smaller teams, differently set up teams. And the fourth part is, which I'm not going to elaborate on today, is about building smaller components. That also helps a lot, right? You go into microservices, you go into micro apps, and all of these micro things have their own pipelines and their own repositories, and they, well, go to production individually. So, the first one. Where are we? Oh, yeah. Here's the thing, you best figure out what the strategy is of your, of your organization. So what's the dot on the horizon they aim for? Every company I go, I go into, the first thing I ask them is, where do you want to go? Where do you want to be in three years' time? Maybe five, depending on how fast the company is. And they're usually like, uh, we're bigger. Or um, as a, a CEO of a company says, what do you want to make? More revenue with higher margins. I'm like, yeah, but how do you want me to build software if that is your strategy? 
You want me to build software that gives you higher margins? What does that mean, right? Where do you want to be? And then you get to these, like, these strategic statements. And you might dislike these. A lot of people are like, yeah, it's just fluff. It isn't, actually. Because most of the times, if they're good, they give you a very good sense of direction. Like, this is the one that we're currently puzzling with. So this is my company, iBud, or the company I work for. And he said, we will be Europea Europe's leading deal site. That is quite a statement, actually. We're active in five countries, or actually six as of Monday. Um, um, we're active in six different countries. That is not the whole of Europe. And then they say, well, it's something like, we want to make, we want to be, uh, it's not here, even. there's a new version of this thing. So we want to be, oh no, it's in, in, in people's everyday life and daily and stuff like that. So they want to make sure that we get through to every one of you in Europe. Um, so sorry for you guys in California, but it's the way it works. Um, it takes another 10 years, and then we'll get there too, right? So, um, and so, Getting towards that other horizon means you need to have one. If you don't have a strategy, you are doomed to stay in the dilemma zone for the rest of your life. Then in that case, there's only one option. That's quit. Uh, yeah, that's... <laughs> so, so the question is, how do you spend your time? We figured out a formula for that at the current client. With every client, it's different. At my current clients, it's this. We said... I want to spend 70% of the time of our tech team because it's the time of the tech team is usually the, limit, the, thing, the limiting part, right? We have 12 people on the tech team, or 13 as of this week, uh, which means we cannot do everything people want. So they need to make choices. And I say they as in the company needs to make choices where we do spend our time on. Now, 70% of that we decided to spend on innovation because, well, they were basically stuck. 20% of it goes, oh, wait, 20% of it goes over into, like, renovation, like adding features to the existing landscape because, well, at sometimes you need to do that too, and there's, like, 10% in solving bugs. And the way we manage it is actually quite cool. We have something called a tech board. And the tech board, what it does, um, all new ideas that are big enough that, that help us reach our strategy from anybody inside and outside the company. So if you have good ideas, just post them and we'll put them on the board. And, and we discuss those and we discuss about, okay, is it something that actually helps getting us toward the strategy? If not, we'll just kill it. We don't do it, right? We have no time to, to waste. And the second question is, can we actually do this? So if this is something so new that nobody's done this before, either we experiment, which means it's probably more complicated than we think, or we don't do it. Again, just remove it from the board elsewise. And then the question is, well, how big is this thing actually? If it's so big that it takes the whole team half a year, it's too big because that means we cannot spend our time on other stuff too. So these topics become too big. So we split them up. Actually, we give them back to the people proposing it, and they say, please split it up. So we're actually now um, um, discussion in, in discussion this week about a new shipping calculator. And uh, apparently, that's a, it's a complicated thing, right? And we listen to it, and we're like, why don't we just look at the first step? Like, um, uh, and they're trying to fit as many packages in one box and make sure that there's an optimal algorithm for that, which is kind of complicated. And then we figured out, or Rob actually figured out, that 70% of our, um, our orders only contain one package, which means, well, th that makes the problem a lot less complicated, right? So take it out step by step instead of doing the really big thing. And then the question is, should we spend our time on this now? If not, we'll put it on the column called Someday Maybe, which is the column we revisit every couple of months, and we look at it again, and we're like, oh, maybe this is a good point in time to do this stuff. Sometimes stuff isn't just ready yet, right? I can say, okay, tomorrow we're going to start on generating uh, our image content using Midjourney. We're not ready for that yet. The company isn't ready for it. So we actually have this on the board. We'll put it on the Someday Maybe column. So the board looks like this. This is our tech board. Yes, it's Jira. I'm not a big fan. I don't know how to use it. Actually, I don't want to know how to use this stuff, but this is what it is. And we discuss this every week with the group of stakeholders from throughout the company, so we actually make sure that people understand what, what we are doing. And then the second step is called the general board, which is where we spend the 20% on. This is basically items that are small extensions to software that is already in production, including the stuff that's on a new platform that's in production. And um, we spend like 20% of our time on it. It's, it's not a lot, but it, it's enough to keep people happy. 
And, and so they understand that we spend most of our time on the innovation part. And then there's like a, a Slack channel, we call it Ask Tech. Um, and, um, and people ask questions. They do that the whole day through, right? And we just monitor it, and um, everybody on the team can say, well, I'll just pick it up, or don't, right? Sometimes you just leave them there, and they'll disappear automatically. Not always, but... Um, so, so this is basically helping us get through the dot horizon, or horizon, meanwhile still maintaining the old systems. But we do allocate enough time to the innovative part. So what's the second thing? So the second thing is about cycles. So who of you is in like a Scrum or Scrum-like uh, team or project or product building or what does that mean? Is the rest beyond Scrum or is the rest in Waterfall? Who is in a Waterfall project? Well, that's the same, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. So let me talk about cycles a little bit. So um, I think that we're going to go to shorter cycles. The length of the cycles we've had in software development, and I've been in this industry quite a long time, um, it's, it's gotten shorter and shorter. Like, um, like in the old days, like 50 years ago, people did waterfall projects. They actually did. They always failed, by the way. Like I think like up to 85% or something, there's different research being done, but a lot of them failed. It's pretty hard to keep it on time and on budget because, well, it just doesn't work that way because our industry changes too fast. And then we moved in the 90s to um, uh, uh, methodologies such as Rational Unified Process and Catalysis and the Spiral Model. And there's this thing, that, there's a slight notion of iteration and incremental work in these, uh, in these approaches. But it was still quite big. And then we got into DSDM, which is like one of the first pre-agile short iterative approaches, like, like late 90s. Um, and, then, and then people came up with stuff like XP and uh, Scrum and um, FDD. And there's, there's lots of these short iterative agile approaches that have cycles of about, no, let's say, two to three weeks. That is what is kind of custom in these ap approaches, right? But um, over the last 20 years, so the Agile Manifesto was written in 2001, um, we got into, well, technology has, hasn't stand still, right? It's not that we're still writing COBOL on the back of a, uh, of a notebook. It's we actually do much more, and we have much better technology in place. We have pipelines, CICD, we have TDD, TBD, DDD, whatever you can do with DD in the end, or just a D in the end. And, and so we, we grew a lot, right? Which means we can go a lot faster if we allow ourselves to do that. So we go into stuff like continuous delivery and even continuous deployment. The most right one being, oh, I'm already in Scrum, right? Uh, the most right one actually meaning just deliver to production automatically all the time. That's actually what we do currently. So every change we make to something, so I checked in some code this morning, it's probably now on production. I haven't checked, but it probably will be, because I wrote all my unit tests and they were working, and my API test was working, so I'm good probably, right? So that means that while this model presented here, <laughs> which is scrub, <laughs> is, um, it was okay 20 years ago, right? This is, it, it has solved a lot of problems in the last 20 years, but we need to move beyond that. The cycles become too long. So the question, and then the question is always like, yeah, 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 but if, you, if you don't, you're not doing Scrum right. And there's lots of discussion, especially on LinkedIn, about what does it mean to do Scrum right? And there's all of these people posting it, even the Scrum Guide itself, which is somewhere here. Do I put it? Yeah. They said, this is from the Scrum Guide, actually. It says, changing the core designer ideas of Scrum, leaving out elements, or not following the rules of Scrum. The rules of Scrum, what is that? Covers up problems and limits the benefits of Scrum. They're basically saying, if you're not doing exactly what we describe in this 14 pages of document, then you're doing it wrong. And then if you fail, it's your fault. By the way, if you do everything correct and you fail, it's still your fault. They're never to blame, right? That's, they only benefit from the certification. So if you see these sprints going red, this customer actually called it red sprints. They say, well, well, we still have work at the end of the sprint. And then they did it the next sprint and the next sprint. And then they hired 300 people in India. Didn't make it any better, by the way. So there was sprint after sprint after sprint failing. And then the project manager was fired. Yes, they had a project manager. It was 2014, right? It started in 2030. They never delivered. By the way, this was software written in Belgium for an atomic agency. Yeah, that wasn't really well, right? So the thing is, 
you might think that you're adopting a framework, Scrum being the most common one. That doesn't mean that stuff is going to work for you. And my good friend Alan, he basically says this. He says, what does it actually mean to be agile? Agile is not a process. Scrum is a process. Agile is not a process. There's nowhere written what exactly you must do to be agile. It doesn't exist. You need to make it fit to what fits you. Right? He says, agile is the ability to create your own process. That is what you should do. And then the question doesn't become, we're not doing Scrum right. It becomes, we're not doing Scrum, right? That's sort of my interpretation of this. And then you can move to shorter cycles because we have automated a lot of things. And if you've automated a lot of things, you can try to release more often. And Jess Humble, the author of the uh, continuous delivery book, says, if it hurts, do it more frequently. He's talking about software delivery, by the way. And, um, and bring the pain forward. You might think he's writing a book on SNM, right? But it's continuous delivery. It's pretty much the same. It hurts. So um, if you deliver a large amount of changes every three months, the delta between the two big systems is really big. And because it's really big, requires a lot of testing, integration testing, system testing, testing all over your landscape everywhere, right? So that is not the smart way to do. I worked for the Dutch Railways. I can say that here, unless it's like um, send out. I'm, I'm actually due to meet them next week or something. So we, I worked there for a while, and they got slower and slower and slower. And in the end, they, they, they had like a quarter release cycle, but they spent so much time on testing the stuff that all of the other stuff they couldn't do anymore. But in, in the end, they had like two weeks left to build new stuff, and they spent 11 weeks testing it. And then they put it into production. That is slowing you down tremendously. So what you need to do, you need to move to very small deliveries all the time. And if you can go in that direction, you can deliver much better and with much shorter cycles, meaning much faster feedback. And faster feedback is good, right? So you basically start delivering small stuff and you break down your software into small parts, smaller parts at least um, to start with, and you deliver them and you put them into production all the time, right? And every time you do it, you make sure that you've automated everything. Uh, that's basically what the next slide. Okay, there's your rune again. He's everywhere, basically. And, uh, <laughs> and, and the thing is, a lot of people rely on stuff like pull requests. Do you do pull requests? Do you code, code reviews? Stop doing that. It doesn't work. Well, it does work, but it's slowing you down. And it's too late. And um, um, Edgar Zdemi said says the right thing about it. He says, he says, seize dependence on inspection to achieve quality. The problem with it is that, you, uh, that, that it's too late, right? The code is already being written if you do a pull request and a code review. You're too late. Instead of doing it after the code has been written and you get it and then you pass it back and forth and back and forth until it's okay to actually release it, why don't you sit together with the people writing it and just write it together? It's a very simple change in your approach and it's a lot more effective. And he says, eliminate the need for massive inspection by building quality into the product in the first place, right? If you do pair programming, mob programming, ensemble programming, stuff like that, it actually works because the code you write together is a lot better already. You don't have to do pull requests and, and uh, code reviews. We abolished all of that. People on my team are like, what? We're not going to do code reviews? Nope. We just write it together. And, um, and, and what about pull requests? No, nope, we're going to not. You just... Push your trunk. Done. Run the pipeline, and the pipeline runs automatically, right? So this is our pipeline, or part of it, and it runs automatically. From the moment I check in my code, here on the left side, where is my thing? Oh, there's my thing. Here on the left side, all the way through formatting, linting, running the unit tests, running sonar for static code analysis, publishing it, putting it in a Docker containing, deploy it to our dev environment, run the API test on it, deploy it to acceptance, run the load test, deploy it to production, and bootstrap the whole thing. Done. These run for like, I don't know, they're, they're a bit slow these days. It's like five to seven minutes, I suppose, at this point in time, if we're lucky. But it's still, we don't have to look at it. It just happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't if it fails any of these stages, we go back and try again. That is the cycle we have. So we have rarely short cycles. As a result, or as a prerequisite to this, you need to automate everything. So your infrastructure becomes automated. Even... The infrastructure to create your infrastructure is automated. So if anything breaks down in our landscape, it pops up automatically again. We don't even have to look at it anymore. 
And that's pretty cool and pretty nice, actually. Our databases actually do the same thing. If they get hit too many times, which happens like every quarter when we have our quarterly sale, they'll just scale up. They'll go to an M140 and even an M200. We don't look at it anymore. It's automated away. And it's the same with testing. Um, I had a discussion with my colleague Rob earlier today about testing. And he's like, why doesn't everybody do unit testing? And I'm like, well, people are not used to it, right? It's not that they might not want to, but for a lot of people, it's still something they're not accustomed to. So I always try to ask, but nobody raised their hand. Who, who, let me put it differently. Who has, what day is it, Thursday? Who has written unit tests today? Uh, today? <laughs> this week. But this month? All right, there's still people, I'm not going to, point out to people, right? but there's still people not doing this. And that's not a good thing. If you want to go faster, you need to do this. All of you, automate it. That means that instead of saying, listen, um, this is our test cone. We have some unit tests. Yes, we have some more integration tests. And then in the end, there's always people testing, checking the spreadsheets with, with the buttons that are on the screen, clicking it, filling in data, la, 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 going through the spreadsheet. Done. Because before they can finish that, I actually was in a situation like this with a company. Before they can finish that, if you push again, <laughs> everything breaks and they need to start all over again. I had this tester coming to me at some point in time, crying, literally, and she was like, don't push <laughs> the code when I'm testing it. I'm like, how long do you need to test it? She's like, a day. And I'm like, if you're testing it for a day, we will have released this code at least like six or seven times. You need to change how you work. You need to automate this stuff. She started doing this, by the way, and she became really happy. Um, and um, in Java, by the way. So, and, uh, so you need to do this. You need to go through having unit tests for everything instead of having a few of those and having API tests. The more complicated the test gets, the less you have of it. And the automated testing, or the, the not automated the manual testing, is only done when you write the code. That's it. Everything else is automated. I can start a pipeline now, and it will run through all the tests that we have at all these levels. And there's lots of testing in there, right? We have like static code analysis. We have unit tests for basically almost everything. And I'm saying basically almost everything, meaning we don't have unit tests for everything. But we do have at least over 80% code coverage on all our code, because that is what Sonar guarantees, right? Sonar breaks the pipeline if we're under the 80%. Also for new code, by the way. And then we run API tests, security tests, integration, whatever we run, right? And we add more stuff to the pipeline every day and again. So as a result, you actually get to code with confidence. Like you don't have to pray anymore, like this poor dude, um, um, that your code is actually running, that it goes to a pipeline, if there is a pipeline, right? And if you don't have automated pipelines, start small, build one with two steps, add a third step along the way, automate that stuff, et cetera, et cetera. By the way, there's a good reason that he's praying is because, well, he works in light mode. Who does that? So the third part and last part for the day, right? So um, we are in the most complex industry there is in the world, without any doubt, right? Rocket science, pfft, Piece of cake. Well, we do that anyway, right? Uh, brain surgery, a yeah, piece of cake. Walk in the park compared to writing software, right? So we are, um, well, basically in a very challenging industry. And Edgar Dijkstra put it right in his paper in thing 1984. He said, the programmer has to be able to think in terms of conceptual hierarchies that are much deeper than a single mind ever needed to face before. There is one conclusion to draw from this, right? So if you have a stack like this, which is the actual stack of one of my previous customers in the last 10 years. They only had like 30 developers, 30, well, 30 tech people, I should say, on board. They could never do all of this. They couldn't. They went bankrupt, by the way. But the only conclusion I can draw from this is that, well, when I started writing software, I knew everything there was about that. I wrote software on a black and green monitor. <laughs> 80 by 24 um, uh, lines, right? So, and that was cool. And I could do anything because it was very limited. But that was like in the 80s of the last century. These days, there's only one thing I know. I cannot know everything. No way. Except if you're Jeroen, right? Because Jeroen knows everything. So he's on the next slide again, right? So, <laughs> so there he is. Here's Jeroen. He knows everything. That's why he's smiling. And Wouter's like... <laughs> Well, he's always like that anyway, so no, just kidding. <laughs> so th the thing is, the smallest unit of ownership of software is not the individual developer. 
because there is no individual developer that can know everything about the code that he's working, he or she is working on. So the smallest unit of ownership is the team. And the thing we did is we started working in actually larger group than the traditional Scrum setup, right? We have what we call a collective. This is um, a, a really famous jazz quartet, um, and, and they can play in all sorts of subsets of this, right? So at some point, the bass player is on stage on his own, or alone with the drummer, the pianist does something solo, does something with the bass player or with the drums, and et cetera, et cetera. They can do stuff in different setups. But it's the collective that does it all. In software development, it's pretty much the same, right? You have a collective, or call it a value stream, whatever you like, that together holds all the skills you need to put your software beyond the innovator's dilemma. Right? And that's a larger group than the six or five or seven plus or minus two people that the Scrum Guide prescribes. It's Sometimes it's 20 people. In our case, current company, it's now 13 people. I work with teams where we had the collective was over 40 people because it was a very complicated environment. And you need all these skills. But the nice thing is, and I'll show you some pictures of collectives. Look, this is a collective. This is at the Dutch Railways, actually. Um, and this is at the insurance company work for. There were larger groups working on stuff. And, and the problem that a lot of companies then face is how do you make sure people do their work? Like in the AI discussion, um, somebody said, yeah, yeah, we need to figure out who we actually grant access to the AI and who not. I'm like, what? Do you actually do that? It's like, no, 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 everybody who wants to use it, use it, right? I just bought a license for the whole team, said, well, if you want to install it, you use it, do. If you don't, also good. I'm just going to fire you if you don't, that's all. But uh, no, no. So, no, I'm not going to do that, don't worry. And it's <laughs> so the thing is, how do we deal with this autonomy thing? Now, autonomy is a really, really tough thing because as the manager, I don't like that word, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm st still struggling with it, but so I write code, too, so I'm just a developer with a big mouth. The problem is giving people autonomy and, 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 and having them the autonomy to do the stuff that you need to do as a developer is really hard. There were people on my current team when I started joining the company, and then they said, oh, please tell me, Sunday, what do I do today? Do I work on the new TypeScript thing, or can I, should I work on the ERP system? And I'm like, I don't know. It's your work, right? You figure it out. And then Joy said, yeah, 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 but what do you want me to do? And I said, I, I have no idea, right? Do you own this shit, right? It's your thing, so make a choice yourself. I said, yeah, but you're the manager. Well, you have these discussions all the time, right? It's terrible. The problem is that for a lot of people, the magic is out of their comfort zone. And the problem for me, as the team lead, whatever, right, is that I, I cannot tell them how to do this stuff. I cannot tell them how to do it. It's a bit like drawing the owl, right? It's like, oh, yeah, I can say, well, you start with two circles, and then, well, you need to figure it out for yourself. The one thing that I did figure out um, is this, is if there's less rules, people take more responsibility. They do, actually. It's my, the only conclusion about playing around with teams for like 20 years is this. And I took this picture um, last week. Um, this is a well, sort of a square in Amsterdam, where at some point in time, they removed all the markings, all the signs. There was a stoplight, uh, stoplight? Traffic light here as well on, this, on the square, because it's a, it's a fairly complicated square. It's pretty near where I live. And um, they removed everything. And as an experiment, and then they, leave, they left the markings that are still there, but the rest is gone. All the signs are gone, the traffic lights went. And, and the reason is they wanted to experiment, but what if we have less rules? What will happen? Will people actually crash into each other? They don't, actually. You know what happens? People communicate. If I drive, I usually drive across this thing. I come from, from the other side, I drive here, straight through, straight across the... <laughs> I just cut off corners, basically. And then I need to look to people who are also on the same crossroads. Because if they make a move, and I make a move, we need to make sure that we don't bump into each other, right? There's only one exception, that's people in BMWs. You don't have to look at them, they'll just drive on anyway, right? There's no communicating with these people. So um, that's the whole thing. So I started taking away the rules. The only thing I did do is I kept the rest of the management team out of my current team. So they don't interfere anymore. They get the outcome. They don't get to interfere. And that's nice because that gives people in the team the trust to do the work in the way that they need to do the work. And I'm not telling that. They do. 
So that's the difference. And the nice thing then is that every time something comes off of this tech board and the general board and whatever it comes off of, or even when people are putting bugs or complaints on the ask tech thing, the team is picking it up by itself. There's nothing I need to do about this stuff. They're fully autonomous in this. So I don't have to tell them, hey, listen, pick up this bug that has been reported now. They do that automatically, or I do it myself. Um, again, with stuff that's coming off the tech board or coming off of the general board, people actually say, oh, you know what, I'll pick this up. People look at the board, people in my team, and say, oh, uh, you know what, I'll pick this thing up. Even the stuff that is not, uh, um, that is not on the board, right? They, they take the responsibility of the full platform. Like, we do improvements all the time. It's not on any board. It's just the work we do. It's part of our job, basically. Um, and the nice thing is, no two work items have the same content. No two work items need the same skill set. So one work item coming off a board might need an, a software architect, a backend developer. This is a Java developer, right? You can recognize them in the wild. It's um, <laughs> just kidding. And she is not a developer. You can also see that. It's my girlfriend, by the way. But um, and um, and. This takes this particular setup. But another work item might use a very different group of people with a very different set of skills. Except when you're Jeroen, because Jeroen is everywhere, right? So, um, and, and then we, we find a sort of recipe of how to work. And, and it's, it, it, it got to me that it was a recipe uh, about five years ago. I was doing this already with teams. Um, and, and the recipe is this. It's very simple. So, in the morning, usually during stand-up, um, some people are done with what they were doing. That happens, right? Well, not on every team, but on our team, it actually happens. And they were like, what shall I pick up now? And they look at the board, or they think about it, discuss it with the team, and I'm going to pick up that one. And somebody else might say, you know what, I want to know something about that too, or I have some knowledge about this stuff, I'll join you. And they just form a group, and they start working on it. They talk a bit about it, so there's no refinement thingies anymore, right? They just talk about it a bit, oh, let's do it that way, let's try this, okay, let's go there. And then they usually start programming on whatever one of the Slack channels, uh, in, uh, whether they're in the office or remote, they'll just work together usually, right? Uh, Rob and I work a lot together, for instance, uh, although we haven't done that in weeks, right? So it's uh, uh, time we figure out something that we can work on again. <laughs> Doesn't matter, right? So, so, and we work with different people all the time. So we just sort of group these micro teams, as we call them, organically. They do their work, um, and then when they're done, their report is done, they disband. So this is Joyce and Claudia. Hey, there's Jeroen again. And um, see, he's everywhere. <laughs> he always sits in the place where I take the picture. No, that's not true. <laughs> so they're working on something, probably backend, because Claudia doesn't like to do front-end work, right? So and here's like um, um, a Java developer and an ops guy. It's hard to recognize who is who, right? So it's um, um, the left guy is the ops guy. The right one is the, the Java guy. They were working on some infrastructure code here when I took the picture. Um, this is uh, also my team. Um, you, you couldn't tell who is the front-ender who's not. Well, you could because he's wearing a hat, right? Front-enders wear hats. That's what they do. Um, and these are our back-end developers, right? This is Eugene. Eugene comes from Gal... I never know. How do I pronounce it? Gal... Gal... Something like that, right? So he's from the East. That's... that's well, I'm not going to tell what Alex told me about it yesterday, but... Um, <laughs> so they're working on something, probably, probably back-end, because Francisco looks really... I don't know what he looks like. He's like worried, I think. So it might be something out of his league or something. So this, and, and this is also a nice picture. Two Java developers and a tester. Of course, the tester has to stand. That's where you're a tester, right? So you need to do the initial mile. And, um, and, and here, this is also a nice one. This is an architect and a developer. You can see he's an architect because he's praying for it to work. And a developer's just like, oh, this is never going to work, right? <laughs> So, yeah, so you get all these different setups, and it's, it, it's really quite nice because what happens is they, these micro teams, they form and reform organically. There's nobody who can tell what will happen next week and who you're working with next week. It's decided by yourself. And um, so the leadership becomes contextual. Also, the ownership becomes highly contextual. The communication is quite easy because usually you work in groups of two or three. Well, it's, it's much easier to communicate with people in groups of two or three than it is with a whole team, right? So that's what usually happens. They get into a call, they do the whole work, done. And then th the funny thing is, at some point in time, I posted something on LinkedIn, and, uh, and somebody asked, so does this stuff scale? 
So the biggest team I've tried it myself with was a team of around slightly over 40 people. It worked seamlessly, right? I didn't even have to sort of ignite it. I just said, well, this is the idea. I'll figure it out, right? And they did. And we worked like that for years, actually, in that team. That was actually the team that got rid of the 30 million lines of code. They actually did, by the way, in the end. It took four and a half years. And they replaced it by a microservices architecture of around 350,000 lines of Java code. Compare that to the 30, 30 million that we had before, right? So it worked quite good. And then ING said, yes, it does scale. We're actually doing this. Of course, they had to rename it. That's what banks do, right? Um, and they said, yeah, yeah, we're using micro squads now. Doesn't make much sense, but then so he said, well, come and have a coffee and see how it works in its scale. I still haven't had the coffee, though, but that's the bank, too, right? <laughs> they don't give coffee even for free. So, in short, uh, you need to do a retro all the time, right? So, please understand that wherever you are, in whatever company, whatever team you're working with, you are somewhere in this model, and probably in different places in this model for different parts of your landscape. Figure out the strategy that fits with that particular zone. If you are in the complicated and the clear zone, it's the easier part. It's more predictable, at least. It's not necessarily easier, but it's more predictable, right? So make, make use of that. But also realize that if you're on the left side in the diagram, and a lot of you will be, actually, that it's really hard to estimate stuff, that there's only one way out, and that is to experiment. And if you still have to keep the shop open, you need to debate where to spend your time. Do you want to go fast? Do you need to change the company really rapidly? You need to spend more time, like the 70% we do. It's actually quite a lot uh, on, on moving away from the innovator's dilemma while also keeping the shop open. There is no end to that. So as a result, you need to make stuff, you, ma you make stuff smaller, right? You build smaller features doing that in shorter cycles with smaller teams and eventually also in smaller components. I didn't touch that part, but that's for a different time, right? So if I can tell you what my team currently does, or here's my team. Where's your room? Oh, there. And uh, <laughs> Rob is also in the picture, uh, which is really rare because he's only in the office one, one day per month about because he lives on the other side of the country. Now, we don't have a country as big as Romania, but it's still a two and a half hour drive, right? So, um, so this is what we do now. We actually adapted to how we like to work as a team, which is very different from any any written approach that I know of, right? We have, for instance, well, no Scrum. We do no Kanban either, right? Kanban is not actually an approach, although there's lots of discussion. We don't have sprints, because if you move continuous, what's the point of sprints? You don't have sprints anymore if you do continuous delivery and continuous deployment. They're just gone. They don't add value anymore, right? That's what I mean with you need to figure out your own approach, and you, yes, you can go beyond Scrum. Or if you're not yet at Scrum, go to Scrum first, right? Take it, take, take it as a as a basis, and then move on from there. Um, we have no Scrum Master. Well, we do no Scrum, so why would you have a Scrum Master, right? We also don't have an Agile coach. I think that these, the, the popularity of the Agile coaches and the Scrum Masters is going to slowly fade away over time, because they only, the only one thing they do is debate how to do Scrum properly, right? And they never agree on anything, by the way, although they all have the same certification, right? Um, we don't have stories. We just have work items on the back. That, that's it. They could be anything. There's no structure in them, which means we can pick them up at any point in time and figure out what to do with it anyway. Uh, we don't do estimation. We just don't. Well, rough ballpark figures like saying, yeah, it's probably like two months. That's, that's as far as we get usually for the bigger ones. And for the smaller ones that are on a general board, we can do it in a number of days because they actually fall into the complicated zone. So we actually can estimate that. And the funny thing is, if you standardize enough on the stuff that you have on the left side of the diagram, you automatically start to shift towards the more predictable part. So if you need to sort of convince your manager to be able to experiment, you say, well, you need to experiment, because otherwise you can never pull this stuff slowly into the complicated zone. That's what my CEO wants me to do, right? He says, well, I want this to be more predictable. And so why? Well, because then I can tell when it's done. Okay, what's the point in that? Right? So yeah, but otherwise you guys take as long as it needs. Yeah, we do that anyway. Well, it's interesting discussions at that point in time, right? So I know retros as well. So this is a retro, the only retro we do this year. Um, so the only thing we do is we solve one puzzle every day. Um, this is Jeroen again, of course. And, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and the one thing that you need underlying this is that you never should stop learning. So it's good that you stayed until the end, right? Otherwise, I wouldn't have anybody to laugh at my stupid jokes. But... Um, Learning is a vital part in this, right? If you want to survive in this industry, you need to continuously learn. 
There's no other way. So the fact that you guys are still here is pretty awesome, actually. Last thing, never forget to have fun. So I hope this was... Um, I'm sorry for going uh, slightly over time. Um, that I'll join the other keynote uh, in. And um, <laughs> yeah, Just kidding. And um, thank you all for being here. Thank you for indulging me until so late. It's late in the day. I think we should probably all go for a beer. Um, that was it. And um, I hope to see you um, soon, any other occasion here in Romania.